And we are recording. So welcome, everyone. Now I, we can officially begin. I know I've been sharing some information, but let me start from the beginning for those who just showed up. So this is the first of five book talks that Ashlyn Chautauqua will host on Zoom between now and the end of April. And we are working our way one by one through the troupe that will perform next July at the Myers Band Show in Ashland, Ohio. So we have Leslie here tonight, but then you will want to make sure and um, get the book on Malcolm X and join Charles Pace in January. And then we've got February, we've got March, we've got April. We have a whole lineup. All of our programming uh, comes from support from our community, lots of organizations and individuals, but particularly we have the um, we have the Ohio Arts Council and we have the Ohio Humanities Council who give us support. And um, we also are grateful to the Ashland Main Street for being our fiscal agent, helping us get grants. And so that is how we can do the kind of programming that we do. So I'm gonna turn things over to Leslie and um, I do want to make sure our recording is working right, though, because I do, I, I want to make sure Leslie is the one we are recording. I'm seeing another face, but hopefully, hopefully Leslie will be recorded when she starts speaking and I stop speaking. Okay, and I, I can certainly test it right now. I'm seeing a yes, little- Yes, there we go. Morning, so okay, hopefully. okay, all right. So this is, this is Leslie Goddard and she will be Lizzie Borden. In the, in the summer, but today she's here to talk with you about the character, and I'm just going to turn things over to her. Okay, sounds good, sounds good, and you might be able to guess, but this is not actually my living room. This is actually the living room of the house that Lizzie Borden lived in after the murders. So, for those of you who are not familiar with the story, I always have to start by saying this is a pretty gruesome story. So be forewarned if you are um, sensitive. It's a fascinating story, but it's also remarkably uh, a violent uh, event. To, uh, fascinating. And I will tell you also that I am a huge true crime buff, which is part of the reason I'm so fascinated by this case. I'm going to switch over. I want to show you some slides just to kind of set out. For those of you maybe not familiar with the story, I want to give you just a, uh, you know, maybe 15, 20 minutes of sort of an overview of the story and the story specifically the way that Sarah Miller lays it out in The Borden Murders. This is one of my favorite books about this story. And to get myself in the mood, I have my Lizzie Borden mug. It says, what would Lizzie Borden do, right? And I've got my uh, Lizzie Borden earrings on. Someone gave me bloody hatchet earrings. So I'm oh, also awesome. talk, about talk about it. Um, all right, if you are, let me pull up the, um, the image here, and you can see the cover of Sarah Miller's book. She opens this book. I want to talk a little bit about the story, but I want to talk about why I think this is such a great book. And one of the great things she does in this book is the opening. She starts out with this little jump rope ditty. And for a lot of people, it's the only thing they know about Lizzie Borden. And maybe this is the case for you as well. It certainly was for me when I started uh, this research. The ditty basically goes, it's, a, it's a, used for jump ropes. It's based on an old vaudeville ditty. It basically goes, Lizzie Borden took an ax, gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, she gave her father... 41, right? That ditty, and apparently it started circulating at the time of the trial of Lizzie Borden in 1893. It is the main thing a lot of people know about this case. But here's what's interesting. Nearly everything in this little ditty is wrong. <laughs> the woman who was killed was not Lizzie Borden's mother. It was her stepmother, and Lizzie was very um, explicit about that. She did not die from 40 wax. She died from 17 blows to the head. Lizzie Borden's father did die, but he did not receive 41 wax. He received 10 or 11. Or how about this? Lizzie Borden was acquitted. She was not found guilty. That poem, which is what a lot of people know, the only thing they know about her, nearly everything in it is wrong. 
And it's kind of a fascinating way to open a book, right? Because it's setting up that what Sarah Miller wants to do is tell this story, the nonfiction story of Lizzie Borden, using accounts from primary source evidence, get at the woman behind the myth, which, you know, as someone who does historical portrayals, that's what we all get really excited about. And Sarah Miller is a great historian. She tracks down a lot of evidence and it's primary source evidence, meaning newspaper accounts, letters, trial testimony, that kind of thing. But she tells the story in this really vivid way. It's very much storytelling. It's the book itself, I, you know, it was originally written to be geared for a young adult audience. I actually think it's a terrific book for adults as well. Um, it reads like a novel, but it's exceptionally well researched. It's a stellar example, I think, of how to do nonfiction. So that's kind of the prologue that sets up the book. Then she moves into the main body of the book and it opens very dramatically. It opens to set the scene for you. August 4th of 1892, about 11 o'clock in the morning, Lizzie Borden is standing in the doorway to her family's sitting room, looking at the body of her father, be warned, here comes the crime scene picture. Uh, sorry, sorry, no, this is not the crime scene picture. This is the cover of the book. And that's uh, Sarah Miller. If you're like me, always wanting to know what an author looks like. This is the crime scene photo. This is her father stretched out on the sitting room sofa. He had been taking a morning nap. She discovered his body with his face smashed in. There was blood sprayed across the wall. There was blood dripping onto the carpet underneath. His face was a bloody pulp of it. She was horrified. She ran to the back stairs, called up for the servant Maggie, who was taking a nap up on the third floor. Maggie's real name was Bridget Sullivan. Apparently, uh, Lizzie and her sister could not be bothered to learn Bridget's real name. Bridget ran for help. Several neighbors came. Eventually, the police arrived, and they were there within minutes. Shortly after that, as they're looking around for where is Lizzie's stepmother, they found the stepmother, Abby Borden, lying face down on the floor of the guest bedroom, also hacked to death. Fortunately, in this photo, you can't really see her face. Her the back of her head had been smashed in. This body was much colder. The blood was already coagulating, suggesting she had probably been dead for an hour and a half, maybe two hours. Mr. Borden was pretty recently killed. His body was still warm. Within minutes of the first police officer arriving, the house was practically swarming with officers, searching everything. They searched the barn out back, they searched the attic, they searched the cellar, but they really focused their questioning on that one family member who had been there at the time, and that was Lizzie Borden herself. Lizzie was questioned about everything. Did she see anything? Was anything missing? Did any Portuguese work for her father? This family was of the upper, upper middle class. And as far as these citizens were concerned, Portuguese were foreigners. They were Catholic. They were dark skinned. They were the first to blame for any suspicious activity in Fall River. Now, Lizzie's own story, as it unfolded over a lot of questioning over the next few days, was that she'd had some chores to do. She had some handkerchiefs that needed to be ironed. Everybody in the house had chores. Bridget Sullivan was washing the windows in the house. Her father had gone downtown to check on his businesses. Her father owned a number of real estate properties, as well as being a bank director. Lizzie was waiting for flat irons to heat up on the family stove. She suddenly remembered she was going on a fishing trip the next week, and she thought her fishing lines didn't have sinkers on them. So she would go out to the barn. Here's the image of the house again. In the back there, you can see the barn. The family did not keep a horse or carriage, but they did have a loft space with a workbench. So she went out there, she picked up some pears on the way. She stood at that upper window in the barn, 
ate a few pears, kind of lingered, heard this strange groan, sort of a noise. By the time she came back downstairs, and you might even be able to see in this image, if you look at the image of the house, over on the left-hand side, there's a side door entrance. She went to that side door, entered it, opened up the door of the sitting room and discovered her father's body. Now, as the police are questioning Lizzie Borden, they start to notice something that seems odd. She seemed kind of chilly. When one investigator called Mrs. Borden her mother, Lizzie bluntly interrupted to say, no, 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 she is not my mother. She was my stepmother. She was not crying. She was not hysterical. She didn't seem overly agitated. And with no more evidence than that, Lizzie Borden became the primary suspect. Now, at this point in the story, Sarah Miller backs up and starts to ask who was Lizzie Borden. And actually, there's very little we know about her life up to this point. She didn't attract much notice. Maybe not that unusual in Fall River, Massachusetts. Here is Fall River. It is about an hour to the south, an hour today, south of Boston, not too far from uh, Providence or Newport, Rhode Island. Best known at the time for producing more cotton textiles than any other city in the United States. This is where Lizzie had been born in 1860. And by the way, fun trivia, she was actually christened Lizzie, not Elizabeth. She had one sister, her sister was Emma. This is Emma as a young girl with their mother, Sarah Morse Borden. Their, Sarah died when Lizzie was only two years old. Emma was nine years older than Lizzie, but even so they were both quite young. Now, Mr. Borden did marry again. He married in 1875 to his second wife, this woman, Abby Durfee Gray Borden. It does not seem to have been a love match. She was 37 and a spinster at the time that they married, but it was a really good opportunity for her as an unmarried woman to have her own household. And for Mr. Borden, it was a nice opportunity to get a housekeeper and a and a caretaker for his children. By all accounts, it was a fine match. Maybe not a great romance, but they both seem to have um, agreed with it. And Abby seems to have been a fairly innocuous person. She did not have a whole lot of friends other than her half-sister, who she was devoted to. The relationship between Abby Borden and her new stepdaughters was not especially maternal. Lizzie even said later her, her sister was more of a mother to her. Whatever the case, Lizzie grew up a cultured, reasonably well-educated girl. She, um, she went through part of high school. She was active in charitable groups. She taught Sunday school for some Chinese immigrants. She was secretary of the local fruit and flower society. She might not have been considered beautiful, but she certainly wasn't ugly. She wasn't repulsive looking. Her father was what we would consider quite wealthy. He was worth close to $500,000 at the time of his death. In today's money, that's about 12 to $14 million. And he was a classic self-made man. His father had been a fish peddler. He raised himself up, you know, starting out as a cabinet maker and eventually this uh, bank president. Owned two farms, a big building downtown, a lot of property around town. Not the wealthiest man in Fall River, but very well off. One thing that's interesting to know, this is a sort of aerial view of Fall River in 1877. Fall River is shaped a little bit like a, a basin. The most elite place to live was up on what was called the hill because, you know, it was on a hill. You literally went downtown to get downtown. The Bordens were quite wealthy, but they did not live on the hill, at least not in 
Andrew Borden's lifetime. They lived in a nice size house. It was a comfortable house, but it didn't have modern gas lighting, did not have running water in the upstairs bedrooms. It did have central heat. It did have a flush toilet in the cellar. Some acquaintances later said Lizzie and Emma would have preferred a nicer house on the hill. So living in this house, 1892, we've got Andrew Borden known for being wealthy, but he could be frugal. He could be tight fisted. He was a fair but blunt businessman. We've got his wife, Abby, who seems to be thoroughly ordinary. The most shocking thing about these murders was really Abby's murder. There didn't seem to be anyone who had anything um, inoc I mean, anything uh, beef with her other than Lizzie and Emma. Lizzie and Emma had been enraged when Andrew Borden bought uh, Abby Borden's half-sister a house. She'd been in danger of being turned out. He bought this house. Lizzie and Emma appeared to have been rather incensed by this uncharacteristic flourish of generosity. That's when they stopped calling her mother and started calling her Mrs. Borden. We've got Emma Borden, Lizzie's older sister. She was out of town visiting friends at the on the day of the murder. She was about 15 miles away. And then we've got Lizzie Borden herself. This is a photograph on the far right here of Lizzie in about 1893. And then of course, we've got the family servant, Bridget Sullivan called Maggie by Lizzie and Emma. Apparently their former servant was, was named Maggie and Lizzie and Emma apparently could not be bothered to remember Bridget's actual name. Now, Fall River was a town with the usual sort of waspy sentiments of the era. She was Irish, uh, which was not unusual for domestic servants in New England in this era. Bridget was questioned, but unlike Lizzie, who gave these terse and sometimes inconsistent answers, Bridget's testimony was very consistent. She was very forthright. She had very little to gain from the murders and the police dismissed her as a suspect pretty quickly. Once she was ruled out, the net closed pretty tightly around Lizzie. She had a thin alibi. You know, she'd been in the barn eating pears at the time. She admitted she disliked her stepmother. She acted out oddly. Not only did the police say she wasn't crying, but on the day of the funerals, she did not wear a long black veil or dull crepe clothes. She just wore a black dress. That was not proper behavior for mourning for middle and upper class Fall River of the day. And remember those policemen who thought she was odd. One police officer said, I don't like that girl. Under the circumstances, she does not act in a manner to suit me. It is strange to say the least. He found it quote unquote troubling that she did not cry when they were questioning her. There were several days of investigation after the murders. Finally, the murders happened on uh, August 4th. Lizzie herself was arrested on August 11th. And immediately we start to get the incessant newspaper cover. Newspapers were reporting on everything, even when they had little to say, you will be shocked about this, but reporters glommed onto this story and printed whatever they could. If there were no new details coming out, they just printed whatever they could, sometimes exaggerated. The Boston Globe actually at one point printed an entirely fake story about how Lizzie had been seen through an upper window wearing a rubber cloak and someone had overheard that Lizzie was pregnant. The story was later uncovered to be completely made up and it was redacted, but a good example of that kind of rumor mill running at the time. Now, Lizzie and Emma had jointly inherited their father's fortune. They used it to hire a dream team of lawyers led by the gentleman you see here on the left. Uh, that is Andrew Jennings. He had been their father's lawyer. And on the right, that is George Robinson, former governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. The prosecution was headed up by the district attorney, Hosea Knowlton. He got 
floods of rumors and tips and clues. One man wrote in to say that his sister had once been in bed with a cold and she had a heart problem and Lizzie visited her. And when Lizzie left, there were black marks on his sister's neck and her jewelry was gone. Very typical of the kind of rumors that were flooding in uh, everywhere. Took a while to go through the actual grand jury, to go through all these different um, things leading up to the actual trial, which opened in June of 1893. This is an image of the actual courtroom at the New Bedford Superior Courthouse. Immediately, this was called the trial of the century. There were so many reporters covering it, they had to convert a horse shed out back into space for all of the wire service journalists. There were so many wires running out of the shed. One newspaper said, you could have hung the entire town's wash out on all of those lines. What journalists were obsessed with was Lizzie's looks, her behavior, what she looked like and how she acted. Many of them envisioned this kind of monster, this throwback brute. They were expecting a coarse looking woman, a mannish looking woman, someone capable of unusual physical strength. One newspaper said, it is not so. She is very little, if anything, above average stature for a woman. Most newspaper reporters assumed, as we sometimes do to this day, but at that time it was taken as virtually scientific, that evil, that criminality could be viewed on a person's face. You could see it through how they looked. You could read it through their race. You could read it through their ethnicity, certainly through their gender. Criminals were viewed for the most part as male and definitely through their class. The idea that Lizzie Borden could have done this was shocking to a lot of people and the case became really important immediately because she didn't fit any of the presumptions of what a criminal capable of violence looked like. She was a woman. She was white. She was uh, of a wealthy family. She was a churchgoer. I mean, good heavens, she taught Sunday school, right? George Robinson said in his closing argument, to find her guilty, you must believe she is a fiend. Does she look it? Now, the striking thing about the jury, and this is an actual photo of the jury, you might notice something immediately, right? <laughs> it is all male. Women could not serve on juries in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts until 18, 1951. More than that, they were all white. They were all Protestant. All were real estate owners, indicating a certain wealth. Now, the prosecution argued it would be difficult for anyone but Lizzie to have done these crimes. Lizzie was the only one that day there with a motive to kill Abby. Lizzie acted suspiciously. She said that Abby had received a note from a sick friend that morning. And that note is actually what kept Mr. Borden from looking for his wife when he got home that morning. The note was never found, nor was any sick friend ever found. They couldn't even find any boy in town who had delivered a note to the Borden's house. Some of the most thrilling testimony came on day five when officers brought in this hatchet handle. This had been found among the other family's tools. Amazingly, it still exists if you go to the Fall River Historical Society. And that cut on the handle seemed to be fairly new. And the whole thing looked like it was dusted in ashes rather than just regular dust, suggesting maybe it had been washed and then covered in ashes to make it look like it had just been sitting there a long time. But one officer said he saw no handle, meaning you know maybe the murderer broke it off and burned it. But then another police officer came in and said, yeah, I saw the handle. It was lying there in the work box. There was a lot of procedural bungling, a lot of conflicting testimony from the police. Then Lizzie's good friend Alice Russell testified, and she testified to the grand jury, that on the Sunday after the funeral, the murders happened on a Thursday, on the following Sunday, 
Alice Russell remembered seeing Lizzie standing by the kitchen stove, tearing up a dress, saying she was going to burn it. Alice Russell later reported she found this a little suspicious. Could it have been the dress that she wore while she murdered her mother and stepmother? Possibly. The problem was in court was that no one who was uh, who was questioned during the trial could agree on exactly what Lizzie had born had worn that day. Uh, the a lot of the prosecutors didn't even have a good sense of what women's clothing was like. It was all just a mess. The defense provided no alternative theory. Here's a great cartoon showing the prosecution and the police flinging axes at Lizzie Borden. Um, the defense, I'm sorry, the prosecution did not try to present, I'm sorry, the defense did not try to present any alternative theory. They focused on two things. Number one, all of the bungling and inconsistencies in the police accounts. And number two, how impossible it was to imagine Lizzie doing this. They found a dressmaker and a, and a house painter who said, yeah, Lizzie had a dress that had a paint smear on it. Of course, she would have destroyed it. They got Lizzie's inquest testimony excluded. On one particularly gruesome day, the prosecution actually brought in the um, <clears throat> skulls. They had had the flesh removed from the skulls. And they were able to show with a hatchet handle or maybe a piece of metal the size of a hatchet handle how the hatchet blade could fit right into those particular cuts on the skulls. Uh, here are um, photographs taken of the skulls themselves, although they might be plaster casts of the skulls, whatever the case, these are really <laughs> pretty brutal injuries to those heads. The prosecution's point was to show that only a hatchet, which a woman was capable of wielding, only a hatchet could have made these wounds. It was well within a woman's strength. But the defense said, yes, but in order to have made these blows, the murderer had to have been standing straddling Mrs. Borden, delivering 17 or 18 hatchet blows. Could you imagine a woman like Lizzie Borden doing anything like that? There was a lot of emphasis on Lizzie's womanliness. She, during the trial, she always dressed womanly. She often hid behind a fan. She actually fainted one day when it was unusually hot out. She acted modest and calm. She was said to have a remarkable temperament. She was very controlled. Um, she had a strong grasp on the muscles of her entire person, one reporter said. One thing that Sarah Miller does really well is pay attention to how the newspapers were covering this case. And a lot of it, a lot of what we know is through the newspapers accounts. And they were not always consistent. And they often included as much opinion and speculation as you'd see today. Interest in the trial reached a fever pitch on the final day of the two week trial. Crowds of people pushing in. If they couldn't push in, they mingled on the sidewalk. This is an actual photograph of crowds on the sidewalk during the trial. The defense summarized, and this remains true to this day, that there was no direct evidence, no tangible link between Lizzie and the crime. Her lawyers argued that the whole notion she could have done this really outraged the natural order of things. As a white upper middle class lady, she fell outside criminological understandings of the day. The jurors later told reporters they were unanimous on their very first ballot. They waited an hour and a half just to seem reasonably deliberative and then came back to deliver the verdict of not guilty. Lizzie apparently flew up um, in relief before bursting into tears, personally thanking each juror. Five weeks after the trial, Lizzie and her sister Emma sold the house where the murders had happened. They moved to a very fashionable house up on the hill. Here's the exterior of the house as it looks today. Lizzie changed her name to Lizbeth. She withdrew. She drew as little attention to herself as she could. 
She remained in Fall River, but kept a low profile. Fall River seemed to want to take as little notice of her as possible. Emma stood by her sister through it all. She was a steadfast supporter. They apparently had a falling out around 1905, probably due to Lizzie's friendship with an actress. Whatever the reason, Emma Borden moved out in 1905. Emma gave exactly one interview her entire life. She told a Boston newspaper that while Lizzie might have been peculiar in some ways, as for her being guilty, I say no and decidedly no. For the rest of her life, Lizzie avoided uh, society in Fall River. She fed the birds. She was very generous to charities. She had a great love for animals, engaged in a lot of charitable work. She passed away in 1927. She was buried at her own request at her father's feet. And Sarah Miller ends up with this really striking photograph of Lizzie Borden in later life. She's got this really darling Boston Terrier on her lap. It's kind of a charming picture. Lizzie is where Elizabeth is wearing white. She looks nothing like what people imagine today. And that really is enough to kind of challenge our assumptions about her. This is how her friends and her family tended to remember her. The mystery of what happened has never been solved. No one else was ever tried for the murders. To this day, it remains an unsolved crime. And Sarah Miller has very little interest in solving it for us. Unlike virtually all other books about this, this case, she wants to just lay out the facts and evidence in all of their contradictory ways and say, you know, most books have been whodunits. Most of these books, to a greater or lesser extent, try to prove that Lizzie either must have done it or Lizzie couldn't have done it. Miller instead wants to say, let's remember, this is a woman who was found not guilty. We need to hold both what points to her guilt and what points to her not guilty in mind at one and the same time. She finishes the book by asking, was Lizzie Borden truly innocent? There are a lot of remaining questions. Why didn't she hear more? You know, why burn that dress? That seems really um, uh, ridiculously problematic. But even more than that, the woman at the center of this whole thing remains an enigma. She did a lot of things that were very suspicious but it's amazing how quick the public and the newspapers were to judge her. Ultimately, it's not hard to feel like society then, and to some extent people today, keep on prosecuting her. Being able to see her as her guilt or innocence as unknowable is a difficult thing to do, but it's the only way we can really get at what makes this case so compelling. So. I'm gonna finish up the slides at that point. I'm gonna go back to my bloody hatchet earrings and my what would Lizzie Borden do mug and kind of say one of the things I find remarkable when I finished this book was thinking about, you know, yeah, I, it was fun when someone sent me these earrings, but the reality is this was a real person we were talking about. And it's a real person who was found not guilty. It's hard not to feel like we're still prosecuting her when we, you know, there's, I've, I've also got, I mean, I've got so many Lizzie Borden memorabilia. I've got Lizzie Borden bookmarks. I've got a Lizzie Borden sticker with bloody hatchets. Um, in some ways, I feel a little bit guilty having these because this was a real person. And what she did really did in a lot of ways destroy the rest of her life. So that's my overview, which I went on way too long. So let me stop and shut my mouth at that point. Let's open it up for questions and discussion. And please feel free to add questions into the chat box. I know Star has already put some in there and we can start with those, but, uh, and Cindy, I'll get back to your question, I think a, a little later, because it's more about 
Leslie than it is about Lizzie. So let's let's hear some of the questions about the event. So um, I know Star, I think the first thing she asked was in that picture of the house, where was the hatchet thrown? What roof was it found on? Ah, there was a hatchet that was found after it was found the following summer and it was not any of the Borden's buildings. It was found on the garage roof of one of their neighbors in the back. There were neighbors houses to the side of the Borden's house and behind them. And for those of you not familiar, there was a rusty hatchet found on the roof of a neighbor's house. It was never determined to have been the murder weapon, nor were, and there were actually three hatchets found in the Borden house, not just that one missing a handle. The one missing a handle was never found to have been the murder weapon. It was tested repeatedly for blood, no blood found on it. There was another hatchet um, that had some blood and hairs on it, but they were determined to be from a cow. The actual murder weapon was never located, but there are these tantalizing, tantalizing um, hatchets floating around. Okay. Okay. Um, Star also asked, she said in the book, there was a mention of someone being pregnant, but she didn't catch that it was ah. connected with Lizzie's stepmother. Oh. The, yes, there was a legend that it was actually Lizzie who was pregnant. Now there is zero evidence for that. Uh, it was a, it was a private investigator who sold his story to, uh, I think it was the Boston Globe. The, the legend is that someone overheard Lizzie and her father talking the night before the murder and heard her father say, I will find out who got you in trouble trouble being a euphemism of the time for being pregnant. And the story then goes that um, to cover it all up because he was threatening to, um, and, and there's conflicting things about what would have happened to Lizzie had this been exposed, that maybe she would have been forced to marry whoever got her pregnant, or she would have been disowned by her father. Whatever it is, it seems to give Lizzie Borden a motive to kill her father, which, you know, one of the things that they had trouble with at the time was it's understandable why, or at least there was a seemingly evident motive for Lizzie to kill and, and for Lizzie and Emma to not like their stepmother and for Lizzie to kill her. There didn't seem at least to contemporary eyes at the time, a motive for Lizzie to have killed her father. Um, her father had only wore one piece of jewelry and it was a ring that Lizzie had given to him. He was buried with it. He did not wear a wedding ring. Um, he could be very, very frugal, but he had been generous when Lizzie and Emma were angry because he had bought this house for Mrs. Borden's half sister. He then gave Lizzie and Emma a house. It was their grandfather's house and it was equal in value. So he could be fair. I mean, he could be frugal, he could be tight-fisted, but he could also be fair, um, or at least he could do flourishes of generosity, shall we say. Now, today we might look at it, and I certainly have a ton to look at it and say, yeah, but Lizzie was 32 years old in 1892, living as a spinster. She's unmarried. She, it's expected that she's going to live in her father's house the rest of her life until her father passes away. The idea that she could live in her own house was not something that was conceivable within the strictures of that kind of class and location and age. So she probably was gonna be living with her tight-fisted father in not a nice, I mean, not, not that it was a bad neighborhood, but it was not the elite area of Fall River. Um, and he was only in his seven, he was 70 when he died, so. He might not have died for years. Uh, this is Star. Just quickly, there was mention though that she was on her time of the month or an insect had bite bit her. So that's confusing that she was like, I'm going to find out who did this trouble when it doesn't match her body genetics. So Right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and uh, for those of you not familiar with it, one of the, one of the questions around this murder is, how was it that if, if Lizzie was guilty, 
how was it that there was no blood found on her? Mr. Borden came home at about 10.45 in the morning. The first call to the police department reporting the murders was around 11.13, 11.14 in the morning. Lizzie was not seen with any blood on her between the two murders, nor was any blood found on, on any of her clothes after the murders, other than one pinpoint size drop of blood on her petticoat. And when police asked her about it, first of all, she said, ask my doctor about it. Um, and she had told her doctor it was flea bites, which was a euphemism for uh, she was she was, had her menstrual cycle that time. One speculation that has gone about is that if Lizzie was the murderer, one logical place to hide bloody clothing would have been in the pail of soaking bloody rags in the cellar, which no police officer would have gone through in, at least not in um, a, a sort of um, upper status household of the day. Um, there's no evidence. We don't know if that's what Lizzie did, if she was the murderer, which we don't know either. But um, it would have been the whole idea that Lizzie was pregnant is uh, was based completely on rumor and speculation. And I don't think anyone would have even known at the time um, because it would not have been discussed that um, you know, that was not the kind of thing you talked about at all in those days so no uh, uh, leslie we have a, a very different kind of question okay in yeah. childhood and teen years um was she kind to animals after the acquittal it is mentioned she killed a cat with her bare hands right exactly and this is part of that whole speculation there was one friend who said uh there was a cat who was annoying us and lizzie said oh i'll go take care of it and then went and chopped the head off the cat there is no evidence that she ever did anything like that. There were some animal killings on the Borden property. It seems to have been a flock of pigeons that the Bordens kept in their barn, probably as kind of like families might keep chickens. It was a source of meat for them. At some point in the summer before the murders, there was a, there were two break-ins to that barn, and Mr. Borden at one point went out and killed the pigeons to deter future burglars. Now, in some retellings, the pigeons become Lizzie's beloved pets. There's no evidence that they were pets. In some cases, it becomes Lizzie who does the murder. I mean, there's there is so much speculation going on and on and on. I'll give you a really good example because anyone who does history knows that once a, a rumor is out there and gets repeated over and over, it becomes fact. There was a point in the trial where the prosecution, I believe it was the prosecution, laid out that on the day of the murders, it was a really hot day. I mean, it was early August, which can be very hot. And this has come down through history book after history book after history book about the Borden case. Oh my goodness, it was such a hot day. And here's Lizzie in the barn on a hot day eating pears. Historians only very recently have actually gone to the National Weather Service of the day to find out what the temperature was. It was apparently a very comfortable low 80s on that day. It was not sweltering hot. But that's the way that these legends begin and then get handed down. So the story about Lizzie, uh, and in some tellings, it's like she's, you know, twisting the heads off of birds and um, very brutal. There's really no direct evidence of that. But again, there's no direct evidence she didn't. So who knows, right? So we have two different questions that are really similar. Let me, yeah. Natasha just wrote, were Lizzie and Bridget the only two in the house at the time of the murders? And what did Bridget say to the police? And Dorothy Stratton had asked a similar question. She had said, what do you think about the possibility that Bridget Sullivan, the maid, might have committed the crimes and that she was covering for Lizzie in her testimony? or that the two of them had committed them together. So let's do yes. those questions and if anyone together. saw, there was a movie in 2018 with Chloe Sevigny and Kristen Stewart. And if you haven't seen it, it's kind of fun to watch. 
they suggest that Lizzie and Bridget were having an affair and that they kind of conspired to commit these murders, although Lizzie actually did it. No, there's no evidence of that. Um, <laughs> yes, it is true. Lizzie and Bridget were the only two in the house at the time. So one of the questions is, how did Bridget not hear anything either time? Although remember, Bridget was washing the windows inside and out that day. She could very well have been outside the house when Mrs. Borden was killed. Mrs. Borden probably died between nine and 9.30. And she was up on the third floor when the murders happened, uh, Mr. Borden was killed. Now, both Mr. Borden and Mrs. Borden seem to have been attacked when they were in a vulnerable position. Mrs. Borden was lying face down on the ground. The blows were to the back of her. I mean, you probably saw the skull, like, you know, back side of the right side of her skull was gone. Um, she could very well have been attacked from behind so quickly and so quietly that she did not even have time to cry out. Mr. Borden was probably asleep when he was attacked. Again, the murderer could have struck so violently. I mean, obviously it was violent, um, but so swiftly and so hard, he did not wake up or have time to scream. They were both very vulnerable, which would explain it. Um, at the time, the police very quickly ruled out Bridget. And she's often ruled out by historians today as well, partly because her testimony was very consistent um, and she did not seem to have a lot to gain from the murders that we know of. She certainly had no financial incentive. She doesn't seem to have adored the Borden family. At one point she tried to leave. Mrs. Borden convinced her to stay. Mrs. Borden might have paid out of her own salary. Mm -hmm. But she didn't necessarily know that she would be going to a better house to work afterwards. There just didn't seem to be a motive. Now, the Chloe Sabigny movie makes, you know, the case that there could have been some abuse going on in the family. I mean, we know Sexual abuse happened all the time in the lives of domestic servants of the time. There's no evidence of that at the Borden house. There's no evidence that, for example, Mr. Borden was somehow sexually abusing Bridget. On the other hand, there's no evidence that there's not. Um, we don't know. All we know is that at the time, uh, sexual abuse would not have been discussed and Bridget was ruled out, which is why some historians think she might have been. Now, Lizzie, Lizzie is much more problematic, right? Because her testimony was really contradictory and inconsistent. She was also under the influence of morphine, which she had been given for her nerves. Um, but she did have an incentive. She had the dislike of her stepmother and she had... Um, from today's perspective, she did have a financial incentive to kill her father. And we know that um, financial incentives have led to some pretty surprising murders uh, if you follow true crime cases. So, I'm gonna jump ahead on questions before we leave Bridget and say, Lori asked, um, did Bridget stay on with the family after the murders? She did not. In fact, she left pretty quickly. Uh, she did stay for a few days. She was gone by, ugh, I'm trying to remember, I think by the, certainly by the time of the grand jury. The grand jury, the, the murders were in early August. Lizzie was arrested on August 11th. The grand jury was in December. The trial was in June. I don't believe Bridget was there. Ugh, I'd have to look it up exactly. I, it was not very long, you know, maybe at the time of Lizzie's arrest or something. And she never stayed in that house again after that. So no, she did not hang around for long at all. And she, she did come and give testimony during the trial, which was the same testimony she gave to police. She was very credible during the trial. And now here's a, a question um, that reminds me of the beginning of your performance, actually having seen it. So the book begins with the children taunting Lizzie with the famous ditty. Did that reflect public opinion in River Falls? And did public opinion in her hometown change over time? Uh, and this is one of those 
fascinating things about this case that that it really was inconceivable that Lizzie would be found guilty that and, and a lot of people in town supported her during the trial a lot of she had a, a good number of friends. Um, Sarah Miller actually goes through these really very lovely letters that Lizzie Borden wrote to thank her friends for supporting her. When she was found not guilty, people were singing Old Lang Syne and cheering for her as she went home. And, and keep in mind, in 1892, Massachusetts, there was only one punishment for someone found guilty of murder, and that was death. However, that ditty, which which did start circulating in you know the months around the trial, seemed to reflect what happened very quickly after the trial, which was that people in Fall River shunned Lizzie. And she was not welcomed back in her. She went back to church, and I mentioned this in my um, in my portrayal. She went back to church for the first time a week after the trial ended, and when she sat down in her family pew, everyone sitting around her got up and moved to another seat. Um, she was shunned for sure, which is interesting, right? Because it seems to suggest that there's this there's two things going on that people in Fall River have in the court of public opinion, they find her guilty, but in the court of the, the uh, trial, they found her not guilty. And it's one of the things that's most fascinating today. But I think it's something that we see in our own world. I, when it comes to Lizzie Borden, I'm often reminded of other modern day cases. And the one I've been thinking about lately was um, Casey Anthony. And the reason, do you remember Casey Anthony? She was she was um, accused of killing her daughter. Her daughter went missing for a while, and um, uh, Casey Anthony's mother called the police and said, "My daughter's car, car smells like a dead body." And she was put on trial. She was ultimately found not guilty. Now that now not guilty is different from innocent, right? So we should keep that in mind. With the Casey Anthony case, though. There were photographs of Casey Anthony seen at a party. She, there's photographs of her partying at a nightclub in the months when her daughter was missing and presumably dead. How could she have been out at a party when that was going on? In some ways, it, it matches that judgmentalism that people in Fall River had of Lizzie Borden when she wasn't wearing proper mourn. I mean, today we'd be like, who cares if someone was wearing a veil? But in those days, this was absolutely inappropriate behavior for a daughter to not be in full proper mourning for a deceased father and people judged her for it in the same way that even though casey anthony was found not guilty by the jury a lot of people in the court of public opinion to this day believe she was guilty and she did kill her daughter uh, we don't know, right? The last time I checked, we don't know. I'm, I shouldn't bring up this case because I haven't researched it in that much depth. But the point of it is we still judge people and we still have cases where someone could be at one and the same time judged by the public as guilty and judged by the courts as not guilty. And it happened. This may be one of those questions about, is it true or not? So um, somebody, Natasha says, I remember reading, not in the Miller book, uh, but there was food poisoning that morning and that Lizzie was vomiting in the backyard. Yes, yes. Um, and it's fascinating. The whole family had been sick that week. Um, and, and Mrs. Borden actually thought the family had been deliberately poisoned. What seems to have happened is that Mr. Borden did not like to waste food. So they had been eating they had had swordfish, I think, uh, on Tuesday, and the murders happened Thursday. They'd had swordfish on Tuesday, and they had leftover. I mean, this is summertime, and there's no electric refrigerator in this house. So there was an icebox. Um, but, you know, in the heat of summer, if you're not refrigerating food, it's not that hard to get food poisoning. And they had all been sick. Uh, Bridget that morning said, you know, she was she was washing the breakfast dishes, I think, and she went outside to vomit and then came back in. I don't think Lizzie had vomited. Lizzie didn't eat um, much more than maybe a cookie for breakfast. But all the family had been sick. So the question was, was the milk poisoned? And actually, the milk, their milk was tested to see if it had been poisoned. No evidence of milk. It was probably food poisoning. But it adds to all of that rumor mill going on. And, you know, 
to this day, all of this speculation um, continues to feed the books about this case um, that, um, you know, it's possible. I mean, it's possible, not at this point, not likely, but um, who knows, maybe someone tried to poison them. There was this instance where somebody in town remembered, a, a druggist remembered uh, a woman he was convinced was Lizzie Borden trying to buy prussic acid, which is a very, very effective poison if you want to kill someone. Trying to buy prussic acid the day before saying, I want to clean a seal skin cape with it. Lizzie did own a seal skin cape. No evidence that prussic acid is ever used to clean sealskin capes. The druggist refused to sell it to her because you needed a prescription for it at the time. It fits into this idea, which actually does bear a nugget of truth, as many stereotypes do, that when women kill, they much more often kill using poison than any other um, method, or certainly women who kill use poison more often than men who kill. So it fits into this idea that it was Lizzie. Now, there was apparently um, a, a woman being used for a, a drug sting operation in Massachusetts at the time to see would druggists sell prussic acid. Mm -hmm. Was that the woman they heard? Um, was, the, was the druggist mixing up that woman and Lizzie Borden? Or did Lizzie Borden really try to buy prussic acid? And then when she couldn't, she tried to poison the milk. And when that didn't work, she went to the hatch. We don't know. But it all, it all adds to this pile of evidence that points towards Lizzie Borden, for sure. Here's a question about the the um, sisters. Uh, why were the two Borden sisters not married? Was that common for the era? Good question. No, it was not common for the era. And, you know, there's no definitive answer at the time. Certainly, Emma and Lizzie never discussed it at any point. There has been some speculation that it might have had to do, and again, this is adding to the fingers pointing towards Lizzie Borden, it might have had to do with the neighborhood where they lived. They lived in the downtown area close to Mr. Borden's businesses, so convenient for him, but it was a neighborhood that was no longer where you lived if you were among the middle and upper classes. The male suitors living in their immediate neighborhood would not for the most part, have been socially acceptable for the Borden sisters to have been courted by. The suitors who would have been socially acceptable would have lived in the nicer neighborhoods, meaning up on the hill, but they are not the ones who would have actually been physically in the neighborhood. They might not have been easily, um, I want to say lured, that's not the right word, but convinced to come and um, hang out at the Borden house in this neighborhood. Now, this is all a bit nebulous. There's no rules. There's no law saying someone living on the hill could not go and court a woman living downtown on Second Street. But it does kind of feed into this narrative, which might well be true, that one of the reasons they both found difficulty finding husbands is that they weren't living in the right neighborhood and they resented that. Now, it could also be that, you know, they just weren't, you know, for whatever reason, weren't interested in marrying. It could be that they weren't. Lizzie, for all that she was composed and for the most part, you know, behaved within gender norms, she also was said to have a really bad temper as her mother did. So, you know, maybe Lizzie just no suitors were interested in, um, um, proposing to it. We don't know. We don't know. You can see, right, why people get so completely fascinated by this case. There's just so much rich speculation to, to mine here. And everybody wants to be the one to solve it, right? We want to, to prove who, we all want to know, right? Did she or didn't she? And to actually sit there and say, it is ultimately un knowable. In, and the likelihood of actual evidence coming out at this point is extremely unlikely. To sit there and hold that unknowability in our head simultaneously, it's a real challenge. It, it goes against um, 
you know, sort of human nature, and it goes against most uh, detective novels and and whodunits and stuff. But that's the way nonfiction often works. So you couldn't have set this up better. But so Doris says, do you give any credence in this case to the Occam's Razor theory of mystery solution, which I believe is. Well, I, I think it's if there are two, then the, the most likely would be the one to go to. Is that? Yes. Yeah. 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 If that's what you mean. Yes, yeah. I, I would. I would. Yeah. You know, and sometimes it's put as, you know, when you hear hoof boot, huh, I'm sorry, when you hear hoof beats, don't think zebras because it's more much more likely to be horses. I mean, in some instances, this falls into circumstantial evidence, right? This, this idea that maybe there's not direct evidence, but there's a lot pointing towards it. And when there's a lot pointing towards it, it, it often, the most likely scenario often turns out to be the right one. And I'll put it this way, you know, the reality is that even though it seems so difficult to imagine a son or daughter killing a parent, it's not actually that uncommon, at least we don't have statistics from the 19th century, but in the 20th century, um, there's one study that I find fascinating that says between 1977 and 1982, there were an average of about 300 cases of parasite a year, parasite being a son or daughter killing a parent. I mean, that's almost one, you know, and, and that's almost one a day, right? Um, it's not that unusual. And in some cases, they are uh, sons or daughters who have some real severe mental challenges. But in many, many cases, it's a case of um, severe abuse. And very often, the, the child who kills their parent displayed no violence prior to this and no violence afterwards. Very often they there's it's it's in a rage of passion, which certainly this case, there's a lot of rage in the way these two were killed. They often attack um, uh, the, the parent when the parent is vulnerable. That happened in this case. I mean, there's a lot that points towards Lizzie Borden. And when you have that kind of um, pointing, you know, you can see why people today would would think it. Um, but on the other hand, right, she was found not guilty. And I keep thinking about, and I keep thinking about with Sarah Miller's book in particular, about what a lesson it is in terms of the power of media. In Lizzie Borden's day, the newspapers, in today's world, social media, right, that sometimes you have this case where speculation and rumor becomes indistinguishable from fact. And it, it kind of overwhelms whatever factual evidence there is. And it can end up ruining a person's life. Now, that's not to say Lizzie Borden is innocent, um, but it's also to say she was found not guilty. Um, but we are still assuming today that she was guilty. In other words, um, maybe the more interesting question above and beyond who actually did it and was it Lizzie or not, maybe the even more interesting question is, what does it say about us that we often assume today that she was guilty? What narratives are we telling ourselves that make that overdetermined? Not to say we're not right, but to say we need to get in and, and really look at each piece of it because it's really easy for speculation and rumor to get mixed up with actual fact. Um, and I think, I think, again, I think Sarah Miller does it really, really well. By the way, one thing that I love about this book for anyone interested in um, uh, like a book club, one thing she does so well is she's got these little sidebars and they're often fast. Here's a good one. Uh, she's got a sidebar on breakfast with the Bordens. The Bordens breakfast that morning has been the subject of enormous um, <laughs> chuckling over the years. They had like mutton stew and cookies and a banana and um, it was just a bizarre breakfast. That breakfast, people will say, well, was it that that caused the food poisoning? Was it actually poisoned in some way? La, 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 la. It's a good example of how the rumor mill operates. And um, Sarah Miller is really good at saying, here's the facts, here's the speculation. 
draw your own conclusions. Um, I found myself, as I'm reading the book, swinging back and forth between she was guilty and she was innocent. And I think that's the way in many cases this case functions today. We do swing back and forth. I'm going to do one more question that's about the murders, because we haven't talked about this. But then there are several things that are questions to you about Okay. Portraying yeah. her all that. But yeah. but Tom Rohr did ask uh, about the importance of the two hours between the murders. And and we haven't talked I about I know, that. right? Uh, yes. And for, for the timeline, if anyone missed it, Mrs. Borden was killed between 9 and 9.30. Mr. Borden was killed probably somewhere between 10.45 and 11 a.m. So that's at least an hour and a half between the murders. And this was known, by the way, not only because Mrs. Borden's blood was more congealed and Mr. Borden's body was still warm, but because they actually analyzed the contents of their stomach, which sounds so grisly, but it's fascinating. Mrs. Borden's breakfast was nearly fully, was, I'm sorry, was barely or halfway partially digested. Mr. Borden's breakfast was mostly digested. And that kind of confirmed the time frame. So even in those days, they were able to do that. But the fascinating thing for the whodunit aspect is how did the murder, what did the murderer do in that hour and a half? If it was an outsider, where in the house could they have hidden? And this came up in the trial. There was a closet in the front hallway they could have hidden, but why was there no blood? I mean, there was no blood on the floors. There was no like dots of blood leading from upstairs, downstairs to that closet. No blood dripped in the closet. And, and, and we know this today, it is highly unusual for a murderer to just hang out in a house for an hour and a half waiting for Mr. Borden to come home and fall asleep so that Mr. Borden can be can be murdered. It again points um, towards Lizzie Borden. It points to someone who knew the house and who um, would have known where to go and how to um, be not perceived as a murderer in that hour and a half for sure. So way back at the start, Cindy had asked um, that she was anxious to hear if uh, your thoughts have about Lizzie have altered as you have portrayed her for several months now. So oh, that's such a good question. Yes, actually, they have. Um, I'll say in two ways. Um, number one, when I started working on Lizzie Borden, my initial thought was, oh, you know, in some ways, evil characters are much more interesting as a, as a challenge for an actor, right? I mean, you know, this bloody hatchet is like, you know, what a great acting opportunity. And I was kind of excited. It turned out to be much more, much different um, in that the reality is that Lizzie Borden talking to someone would not have been, you know, she wouldn't even have been talking about the murders to strangers. She was, she never gave an interview about the murders, um, never had a comment on them. And she was someone who was, yes, prone to bouts of anger, but also very collected, very composed, and, and she was committed to proper etiquette. She, she knew proper etiquette Oh, in fact, that great picture of Lizzie with the little Boston Terrier on her lap. In fact, maybe I can pull it up really quickly for you. That picture, one of the reasons it's so fascinating, take a look at how proper everything is in that picture. I mean, look at the plants on that table over on the right. I mean, they're like perfectly spaced on the table. She was exceptionally um, proper in everything, which means it's much more difficult to... Um, to convey this person. I mean, you have to convey her as proper, but at the same time, these murders were really horrific. So it turned out to be much more of an acting challenge than, than I ever thought it was. But above and beyond that, it's hard when you're, when you're researching this character, I found it hard not to feel like Lizzie really was getting to this day has gotten everything thrown at her. The fact that we don't remember that she was acquitted suggests the case is a lot more complex than what we tend to think. We tend to just reduce her to, you know, a, a jump rope ditty. We tend to reduce her to bloody hatchet earrings. And that plays into our desire to kind of um, 
judge people. And, and I found myself saying, it's such a good indication that we can't always judge people. And we certainly can't judge people based on how they behave. Um, there's a great criminologist. He's the guy who, um, if anyone saw the movie, uh, I'm sorry, that, that great television series, Mind Hunters. Do you remember that? There's this guy who was one of the earliest profilers. And he actually, um, in many cases says, you can never predict how someone is going to act at a moment of crisis. You know, someone who discovers that a family member has been brutally murdered, you cannot judge them. A lot of people were judging John Benet Ramsey's mother for how she behaved that morning. There was one policewoman who said, oh, I knew, I knew it was Mrs. Ramsey that morning. She was acting so weird. Well, over many, many years, and I don't think that case has been solved, but I think it's, am I right? It's pretty much agreed on today that it probably was an outsider who came in. Um, it's almost certainly was not the Ramseys themselves who, who killed their daughter. It's very easy to judge people based on how they behave. I mean, it happened to Casey Anthony, but it also happened to um, Amanda Knox, the, the woman who's, um, she, was in, she was a student in Italy, she's an American, uh, she was in Italy and her roommate was brutally murdered and people thought she was acting weird that day. Well, you can't judge someone because they acted weird in a moment of unimaginable stress and tension. That's the reality. And um, how, to, how to keep that in mind when we approach a true crime case, it's really, really hard. Um, I found myself much more sympathetic to Lizzie and I went into it thinking, yeah, she probably was guilty. I mean, you know, the evidence really does point to her. It's hard to see how anyone else but her could have done it. But at the same time, she was found not guilty. Um, I found my feelings much more complex than I thought they ever would be. Um, and I didn't expect that. Yeah. yeah, I think you kind of answered because one of the questions um, was as you got into the character in order to portray her, did you develop any insight into whether she could have committed the crime? So it, it yeah. sounds like like yeah. it, it made you more um, conflicted. Yeah, yeah. It, it really did. And you know, I, I will say one thing, uh, you know, as I'm doing this research, I was looking into, I was doing some research under the history of um, parasite. And one of the things they said is, you know, very often when it comes out of nowhere, it's a case of severe abuse. Now, had there been severe abuse in the Borden family, we don't know at all. You know, there could have been, you know, emotional abuse, there could have been sexual abuse. We don't know. There's no evidence for it. But it is absolutely true that when a child kills a parent um, and it's coming out of a case of abuse, very often the, these people had shown no sign of violence before. Um, they had not found anyone willing or able to listen to them and take them seriously. They felt trapped. They felt as if they had no choice. Lizzie Borden was known to have had a temper. And the analysis of people who kill their parents today show most people later identified as severely abused had approached life fairly passively until the homicide. Their friends were typically nice kids. They were relatively uninvolved in any criminal behavior prior to the killings and didn't show violent tendencies after the murders. Lizzie Borden fits that profile in a lot of ways. Um, in which case, you know, if she was, and again, I don't want to say she was, but if she was, and she could have been, then she could have been a severely abused child who felt like she had no choice and who, in this moment of passion, committed this act that freed her and it ruined her life. And that situation, I don't wanna say it was the situation, but I do wanna say we don't know it wasn't the situation, I means she would have been deserving of a lot more sympathy than she ever got then, or than she ever um, has received from us today. And that makes her really, really fascinating um, as a historical figure question that just came in about, did she and her sister ever reconcile? They never did. They both died within about a week of each other in 1927. 
uh, Lizzie actually had had a gallbladder operation the year before, and she'd had health problems ever since, and seems to ultimately it was heart failure that that um, came. Um, and, and Emma had fallen down a flight of stairs, and it seems to have um, um, uh, contributed to some health problems that she had. They never reconciled. Whatever it was that led to their falling out, and it probably was the fact that Lizzie was um, uh, fraternizing with these actors, which, you know, was not the thing that proper upper class Fall River citizens did at the time, might have just been the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, Lizzie um, was very close to one of their coachmen. There's been some speculation. Maybe it was more than a friendship. We don't know. We don't really know the cause of it. Um, and they did not ever reconcile. They, when Lizzie passed away, her will said she left nothing to her sister, but she said it's because my sister is well provided for, which was absolutely true. They jointly inherited their father's estate. Um, they both left all of their money to different charities. Lizzie left, the, her largest bequest was to the Fall River uh, Animal Rescue Society. Um, she had this great love for animals. So no, they never reconciled. But um, when there was an article, it came out in 1913, an article reviewing the case and basically, you know, speculating, was it really Lizzie? That's the one time Emma ever gave an interview. And she absolutely said, um, whatever our reasons for have, you know, we don't talk today, but I do not think she was guilty. Um, so she stood by her right to the to the very end. Okay, someone just said I'm a Leslie Goddard groupie. I uh, can listen and watch to you all day. Fascinating book discussion. And I have seen you display, whoops, wait a minute. <laughs> that went away. She's seen you do the Lizzie character. Um, so she's thanking you for this. Uh, Thanks. That's um, let's see. Has it been brought up that there is a faint connection between Nance O'Neill and Lewis Bromfield? Ooh, uh, Nance O'Neill, for those of you not familiar with it, was um, the actress that Lizzie was really enamored of. You know, it's one of those interesting things. And, and here's what I'll say for anyone interested in the Lizzie Borden case. One of the reasons this case is so well remembered today, above and beyond that little ditty, is that there are these interesting, I don't want to say rabbit holes, but there are these really fascinating aspects of the case. And the whole Nance O'Neill um, topic is a whole rich field to mine in and of itself. But having said that, there's a lot of other topics I also haven't touched on here today that are, are really equally equally fascinating. Um, I barely touched on the, the prussic acid thing. There was an uncle who was staying in the house, their uncle John Morse, who was in the house the night before. He had an alibi, but some people think he was guilty too. There are these really fascinating um, side issues that might not actually be side issues, they might actually be central to the whole case that uh, I haven't touched on. So basically, that question is a really good moment for me to say, you know, there are some great other books to, to check out about them. Not just Sarah Miller's book, but there was a great book that came out. I actually have the dust jacket. There was a great book called The Trial of Lizzie Borden by Kara Robertson that just came out, what, two years ago, 2018, I believe, or 2019. Um, I believe she's got something about the Nance O'Neill uh, Bromfield connection. Um, there's a number of uh, and um, if anyone's really a diehard fan, there's a great book called Parallel Lives. It's a it's a study of Fall River and Lizzie Borden, and it's fab. It's like a coffee table book. It's a great great book. So a lot of these other aspects are absolutely fascinating to to delve into. You can go online. You can go to lizzieandrewborden.com. Maybe I should put that into chat. lizzieandrewborden.com is a fabulous website. You can go on there and you can read the trial testimony. A lot of the inquest testimony is in there other than Bridget Sullivan's, which has mysteriously disappeared. A lot, lot of um, really fascinating aspects of this case to explore. Um, it's a, it's a gold mine. <laughs> 
I know we talked before things started, but have you talked about the backdrop? Yeah. Oh, you know what? I didn't. Um, and and there might, probably are folks who joined us. The backdrop behind me, this is not obviously my own sitting room. This is the sitting room inside Maplecroft, the house that Lizzie and Emma bought five weeks after the trial ended. It still exists. It is um, in this fashionable neighborhood. The fact that they moved to this fashionable neighborhood five weeks after the trial ended does suggest to some a financial motive for Lizzie to have done the murders. On the other hand, you know, it's a nice house, but it's not a huge splurge for people with the wealth that they had. I believe they bought this house for around, it was about $13,000, I believe, when they bought it. They paid their primary attorney, George Robinson, they paid him $25,000, to, um, which, is a, which was a lot of money in those days. Um, so they spent about half that amount to buy this house. So it was a really nice house, but it wasn't a wild extravagance suggesting that um, you know, they were complete spendthrifts. Um, but it, it wasn't a really nice, much nicer neighborhood where they seem to have wanted to live. So by the way, this house just came up for sale last year, which is how I was lucky enough to get a photograph of the inside of it. And for anyone interested, the house where the murders happened is still there. In fact, it was converted to a bed and breakfast within the last, boy, it was what? 10, 15 years ago or something. It also was sold last year. Lizzie Borden fans got very worried. It might you know, no longer be open, but it was purchased by a ghost tour company that has um, continued to run it as a bed and breakfast and they give tours. They now give ghost tours. So if you think maybe the house has some paranormal activity, you can certainly stay overnight in the room where Mrs. Borden was murdered, where her body was found, um, if you are of that sort of disposition. Um. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. You have done a wonderful job. We may not have hit every single question, although I think sometimes you answered the question uh, <laughs> in other ways, so I didn't even have to ask all of them. We um, are so grateful for everyone for showing up. Uh, please come back. Uh, please come this summer to see the Lizzie Borden performance, if you can make it in July, to Ashland, Ohio. But please pick up the book uh, on Malcolm X that is by... See, it's Stephen Clark, uh, Steve Clark, who has written a book, Malcolm X Talks to Young People. It's some speeches that he's given. So January 13th, Charles Pace will be zooming right where Leslie is, and he will be talking about Malcolm X in that book. Um, we appreciate you all coming. There should be a survey that pops up as you leave Zoom tonight. It's working sometimes and it's not working sometimes. There's also a link to it right here in the chat. And we're also going to send a follow-up email tomorrow that will also have the survey. If you could please fill out the survey for us, it helps us with grants to say, here's what we did. Here's how effective we were. Here's how wonderful Leslie is uh, in talking about this topic. So we would appreciate one way or the other you finding that survey. And we're glad you're here. And we hope that you come back for all four of our other books. Thank you so much. Thank you, Leslie. Thanks for coming. And uh, we will let you go on with your night. Thanks. Good night, everybody. Good night. I'm going to stick around to see. Oh, no, I need to maybe end to get you your survey. I think maybe that's how this works. So good night.